This is such a pleasure. For me, this is the most fun part of the day, and that's not me in front of the mic. That's being able to give Suzanne Tagan from the National Renewable Energy Lab the Government Award. Now, you heard a bit um, from Deputy Secretary uh, this morning about how women were not allowed on boats, and so they didn't get to go to the Antarctica. Let me tell you, Suzanne has been at the, in the Antarctica. Not only that, she drove a bulldozer for three years down there. She, she noticed that there were all these waste materials that would have to be shipped back to the U.S. and cost a lot of money, so she decided with this bulldozer to start a waste management and reduce shipping costs and start this whole program. The first year, they saved $40,000. The second year, $80,000, and they're still doing this today. That's before she joined the government. Now she's been at NREL for over a dozen years, and she's done what I think really exemplifies what a government employee would do, which is to stitch together this deep technology knowledge with public policy interest and then create really strong creative solutions that enable women to succeed. She and I chatted because um, I'm an alum of NREL, so I have a soft spot for the lab. It, it really was the best place I ever worked. And I have my own company, so that's saying something. Um, and um, she, when I talked to her, to uh, or some of her cohorts at the lab, and there are a lot of NREL folks here today, I said, you know, what, how would you describe her? And they said, boundless enthusiasm for clean energy and for women in energy. She advocates for her staff. Four of her staff have got staff awards. Now, I got a staff award, which I have moved with every single house. I dust it off. I hang it up. It, those are awards that say the staff that you work with think what you do is good. That is a prized possession, and she has enabled four of her staff to get those awards. She advocates tirelessly for women. She's been working with WOWI um, on their board. She just completed a study on women in wind energy. They're 20% of the wind energy employees are women, um, mostly in admin and legal, so we need to work on that to get it more in the technical side. But she's been a tireless advocate in addition to representing the U.S. and way that we should all be proud of. And I am um, extremely proud and honored to give this award for government to Suzanne Tagan. Please come up, Suzanne. I did not know you were going to bring up the bulldozer. <laughs> thank you so much. That was a really nice introduction. And uh, thank you to C3E and to Stanford and MIT, and thank you to the Department of Energy. This is a really meaningful award for me, um, and it's very humbling to be in this cohort of uh, very motivated and successful women leaders. So um, thank you. Uh, last week, I was at the American Wind Energy Association's Wind Power Conference. They have a national conference. And there were two competitions there uh, that I was uh, helping with. Uh, one was called the Kid Wind Competition, and one was the uh, Department of Energy's Collegiate Wind Competition. And it was really exhilarating to be there and watch uh, these, these students and the younger kids in elementary and middle school compete. They all um, built, they designed and built and then tested wind turbines. Um, and just kind of to see that glow about them, they were all so excited about it. And um, we do this for these, uh, the students and the kids so that they get inspired to be in the STEM field. Um, one of the things that I noticed, I will say that one of the teams um, in middle school, um, or maybe they were a little younger, I think they might have been in fifth or sixth grade, they're from Virginia, they were an all-girl team and there were four of them, and they called themselves Kitty Wind. And they had baseball caps that they hot glued stuffed animal cats to with a pinwheel. They were so great. Um, and they were very inspiring to me. And then so I, I saw all these girls, it was about 50-50 probably, girls and boys, um, at the Kid Wind side. And I went over to the university side, and 
Out of 170 people, there were um, in the, in the collegiate win competitions of students and professors, there were only 29 women. So one of the things I want to do um, this coming year is work to change that imbalance. Um, and so I look forward to working. I know my, the people on, on that um, collegiate wind competition team and the people at the Department of Energy are also ready to do that. So that's one thing we're going to work on. Um, I serve on the board of Women of Wind Energy, where I get to talk about these issues with very inspiring leaders like Kristen Graff and Karen Conover, and we know how important it is to keep girls at this very critical age, um, around eighth grade, fourth grade to eighth grade, inspired. Um, so I try to go to my daughter's schools and uh, talk about Antarctica and climate change and talk about wind power uh, and get them inspired. I try to volunteer to give tours of the National Wind Technology Center uh, when I can. Um, and now at NREL, we're getting a women's group off the ground as well, thanks to the support of leaders like Bobby Garrett and Barb Goodman. Uh, we spend time, we recommend to each other helpful uh, resources like the Facebook implicit bias training, which I highly recommend. It's really easy. You can um, watch it on YouTube. Um, and then we also support each other by, um, you know, sympathizing about work-life imbalances that, um, that exist in any workplace. Um, I've been really lucky to work with inspiring mentors and renewable energy pioneers um, like Ed DeMeo, who's here today, and Bob Thresher, and Jan Hamron, and Rudd Meyer. Um, they've taught me that meaningful change takes time, um, especially when you're working with the government. It's a, one of those big ships, and it takes a long time to move, but stick with it and persevere, and you can make good change happen. Um, especially in a bureaucratic environment, it's easy to get caught up in paperwork and policies and procedures. And uh, I have mentors at work like Anne Brennan and Marguerite Kelly and Ian Baringold and Michael Milligan who remind me that I'm doing the right thing when I put people first um, instead of just the, the policies and procedures. Um, we are working to make this a better place for our, our grandchildren and their grandchildren. Um, and speaking of children, I need to thank my daughters for their patience with my time-consuming career. I'm not the mom, like many of you probably, who is able to drop them off at school or pick them up from school. I'm not on the PTA. <laughs> I'm at work. Um, so it's a different, I guess, a different way to be involved in your kids' lives. And when I am with them, I try to be really present with them and to show them that moms can uh, work to be leaders and work to change the world, make the world a better place for them and for their children. I um, also wanted to thank my sister, my parents, my grandparents, who've all, um, always encouraged me to travel and um, learn from different cultures and even live in different places, like Antarctica. <laughs> um, there are so many people around the world who have great ideas and solutions to some of these problems that we're talking about. So um, thank you again very much for this meaningful award. And now let's go help girls and women become a bigger part of the clean energy workforce. Thank you. I want a bulldozer in Antarctica. <laughs> um, it's great to be back at Stanford among so many incredibly brilliant women, um, to have had Secretary Moniz here and Secretary Schultz and Secretary Cho. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Sally Benson and Lee Johnson for putting this all together. We have a round of applause for them. Really great work. Congratulations. <clears throat> I grew up seven miles west of here, up in a little town called Woodside, and I became a clean energy advocate at the tender age of about 10 years old. There was a lot of air pollution um, before Silicon Valley arrived, and um, so I hitched my pony up to a pony cart and put a sign on the back that said, fight smog, drive horses, and I took off down Sand Hill Road towards Stanford University. So Stanford's always been sort of central for clean energy in my mind, and um, our law and finance winner today also sort of started her clean energy career being um, intrigued, if we could say, by uh, air pollution. So uh, I'll let her tell you about that story. It's my honor today to present the Law and Finance Award to Catherine Zyla. As uh, you probably read, but I want to read the definition of this award because it recognizes lawyers, finance professionals, or academics at professional schools who've enabled or advanced the development and deployment of innovations, 
innovative clean energy financing solutions or enabling regulatory structures. Or in this case, the winner of our award embodies all of those things, which is really quite remarkable. Usually it's one or the other. Um, Catherine has that rare passion and ability to communicate and manage complex policy uh, solutions and affect regulatory processes. Uh, she grew up in Detroit, and she told me a really interesting story that as she went to high school, I guess at one point it had been a boys' school and a girls' school. It was now all one school, but it had two separate mottos. And the motto for boys was, aim high, and the motto for girls was, enter to learn, go forth to serve. And she noted at that time, uh, it sounds like she noted it to several people, uh, that she actually felt that it was kind of important that everybody had the same motto. And um, so her motto now is, aim high, enter to learn, and go forth to serve. And I think that you can see from her um, career, she's done all that. Um, I do the words creative resilient, and maybe most importantly, fearless to describe her. She's a incredible engineer, a public policy specialist, and she's also a lawyer. I mean, can you imagine? She's like everything, and I'm so in awe of her. So she got her um, master, excuse me, her engineering, a BS in engineering from Swarthmore College. And then she'll tell you, she wasn't really excited about being an engineer, so she decided that she'd go to the Yale School of Forestry, and there she got an, a master's in environmental management. Um, so with public policy under her belt, she decided maybe she should be a lawyer. So she got a JD cum laude, nonetheless, from Georgetown. So with all that behind her, she now serves as the director of Georgetown's Climate Center, which is actually located on the campus of the Georgetown Law School. She manages their staff research, policy analysis, and facilitates multi-state dialogues. Um, and while she's doing all of this at a really high level, she's mentoring students, a lot of female students all along the way. So I'd like to say that today's winner in law and finance is an extraordinary woman who I really look up to. And Catherine, could you please come forth and get your work? Congratulations on behalf of all of us at C3. Wow, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And, and thank you to the C3E ambassadors for selecting me for this award. It's really a privilege to be among the recipients and a part of this impressive event. I also want to thank Vicki Arroyo, my boss at the Georgetown Climate Center, and my mentor who nominated me for this award but couldn't be here today, and my husband, Brian, and my two kids, Jake and Ella, who dropped me at Dulles on their way home from vacation this weekend so I could be here with you because they support everything that I do. It's a little jarring to hear myself nominated for a law award. I actually didn't think until pretty recently that I would ever be a lawyer. Um, I started out interested in science and engineering, and to the credit of my parents and my teachers, no one ever suggested I should do anything otherwise. As we know, lots of young women aren't so lucky. I was a Detroiter, and so like many Detroiters, I was really interested in cars, big, old cars. Um, and then I started learning more about environmentalism and air quality and realized that there were some real downsides to the big cars that I loved so much. So I became an engineer so that I could figure out how to drive a Chevy Bel Air that was completely environmentally sound and didn't make me feel bad at all. Um, and I went to engineering school and, and figured I would just work in clean energy and then realized that I had no idea how to do that. Um, I didn't really know what to study. I didn't really know what mechanical or chemical engineering would bring me in terms of energy. I ended up in environment electrical engineering, because it was energy. But to the, to the point earlier about the, the women in the Society of Women Engineers looking for the clean energy field, I didn't know how to find it. So I left school and did some other stuff for a while, and then I learned about this thing called policy. And I went back to school, and I studied policy, and I learned about climate change. And I learned that clean energy is really not just about air quality, but that climate change caused by energy combustion and other things as well exacerbates air quality and also brings uh, risks of urban heat, of drought, of flood, of storms, and all sorts of other host of problems. And this really gave my interest in clean energy a home. 
And so I went to Washington about 13 years ago to work on federal climate legislation. We're finally going to tackle climate legislation in Congress. Um, 13 years later, we do not have federal climate legislation. Um, but we found other paths. We found that states, in particular, um, have made enormous progress in addressing clean energy and climate change. Um, my center, the, the Georgetown Climate Center, where I'm the deputy director, was founded in 2008 to work with states, to be a resource to states, and to work with the federal government to inform it with lessons from the states. And now we see that 37 states have a renewable energy portfolio standard or goal in place. 37 states have policies to encourage electric vehicles. 20 have greenhouse gas reduction goals. Our center is actually working right now with a group of states in the Northeast, um, working together to develop potential policies to reduce emissions from transportation. This sort of thing has really never been done before, and it's really an exciting honor to get to be a part of working with these states to do it. Despite the lack of federal legislation, the federal agencies have really been leaders as well, and we try to help them as best we can. Uh, the federal vehicle standards that have been promulgated will achieve an average greenhouse gas uh, emissions per mile for the 2025 vehicles. That's half what 2010 vehicles emitted. And the Clean Power Plan we talked about earlier is projected to achieve a 32% reduction in CO2 emissions from the power sector. And though it's being challenged in court, a lot of states are already moving forward. I have the pleasure of working with these states to develop the policies, to figure out how to pay for their programs, and also to identify the legal barriers they find that stand in their way. So a local government can't enact a stronger building code if the state law says they can't do anything other than state building codes. The EPA works with the confines of the Clean Air Act because that is the legislation they have to work with. And so I didn't stop at engineering and policy. I was at a law school, so I, I studied law. Um, it also got my son into the daycare at the law school, which was really handy. Um, it didn't help that I had my second child while in law school. I don't recommend that. Um, but what I learned is that my path to clean energy into this field is a lot like the path that clean energy has taken, really non-linear. Uh, and so I, I think about my, my, my field in a similar way. Um, I had my, my R&D period where I experimented with jobs that didn't actually end up taking me in the right direction at all. Um, I really would have benefited from some nice startup investment that I didn't have at the time. Um, ultimately, I came at the field from lots of different angles and just stuck with what worked. And, and all of the things that I learned really do help me every day in my field. And I noticed that whenever I'm in the room with policymakers talking about both public utility regulation and circuit diagrams, it's incredibly helpful. Um, and much like our state and local policy laboratories, I learned that the, sometimes what worked for me could actually also provide lessons to others. And so it's really a joy for me to work with the state and local and federal policymakers who are encouraging and promoting and incentivizing all of the technology work that the engineers do, and with the students at the law school who we can help train to find that clean energy field that, that I found so hard to, to discover. And so I'm very grateful for this award and the opportunity that it will provide me to work with young students as they try to find their clean energy space. And someday I hope that one of them will develop that zero emission Bel Air that I can drive around Detroit. So thank you all very much.